Hello and welcome to this video on neural ultrasound. By this time you should have also watched the Nalbology video and you should watch this video prior to the first ultrasound lab of the year. So let's get started. These are the objectives of this video. First we're going to look at the eye in, on ultrasound. We're, we'll be identifying the anterior and posterior chamber, the lens, as well as the retina. And we'll show a couple of examples of retinal and vitreous detachment. Then we'll look at the optic nerve sheath. We'll use the depth and gain function, as well as a caliper to measure the optic nerve sheath diameter and show instances of where the ONSD is widened by increased intracranial pressure. And then lastly, we'll look at the peripheral nerves in the forearm. We'll briefly go over the appearance of muscle bone as well as the blood vessels and the nerves in the forearm. And we'll look at uh, some example of nerve blocks. So you should have uh, a working knowledge of knobology. Remember that this, this knob right here will increase or decrease gain by um, whether you turn clockwise or counterclockwise. And the same thing for depth right here. This button right here will, will actually freeze the image. And when you press freeze, you'll actually have a change in the function of these buttons. So here, if you notice it says 210 or so, you actually have 210 frames to scroll back on. So you will be able to find the frame that, that is clearest for you, for you to do your measurement for ONSD. When you're, once you're ready to do a measurement, you can hit the caliper button right here. And you'll have these calipers pop up. If you're using a machine like this, you have the same depth uh, functions or buttons right here where this will decrease depth, increase depth. And remember that the depth is represented on the right side of the screen by these numbers and these little hash marks. And then the gain buttons here, this is the near field gain, meaning the, the top part of the screen. This is the far field gain or the, the, the bottom part of the screen and this is overall gain. And if you ever get into trouble, just hit auto gain right here. As far as freeze, the button is right here to hit freeze, and then you have your caliper uh, button right here to do your measurements. And then on both machines, you can use the trackpad to um, make your measurements. All right, let's get down to it. This is your eye right here. The tough outermost layer of your eye is the sclera, and that provides structure to your eye. This is highlighted in yellow. Just deep to that is the vascular layer of your eye called a choroid. And then deep to that is actually the retina itself, which has its three layers, both the pigmented epithelial layer, your uh, photoreceptor layer, as well as your ganglion or neuronal layer. And what you'll notice is that um, basically that the retina is contiguous with the optic nerve. The, the optic nerve is, attaches directly to your retina uh, up to the point of your anterior borders of your retina, which is called the aura serrata right here. And then within the retina itself, you actually have the macula. The macula is typically lateral or, uh, or temporal uh, or to the optic nerve. And within that is the fovea, which contains the highest concentration of photoreceptor cells and is responsible for your central vision. And this is really important when we're talking about retinal detachment. Also, what you'll notice in the sagittal cut of the eye is that um, this is the retina right here. This is the optic nerve. These are the central retinal vessels, your central retinal artery and, and vein. And in about three to five millimeters posterior to that, you'll see that, um, that the optic nerve sheath right here can be readily distensible if there's increased fluid in the subarachnoid space. And that's because the optic nerve sheath is actually contiguous with the subarachnoid space. So when you actually have in elevated intracranial pressure, that optic nerve sheath can actually distend. And this is uh, basically what you see in papilledema. So this is how your eyeball looks on ultrasound. Um, what you'll notice is that most of it is actually the posterior chamber. Uh, you have your anterior chamber up here, you have your lens, your iris, and this is where the retina will attach. You, you won't really notice the retina on, on ultrasound unless it's detached. And then here, this hypo or anechoic segment right here is actually your optic nerve, and you can measure the sheath 
by the in the inner wall to inner wall borders. So in terms of patient positioning, you want to have the patient either seated with backing or supine, and this has to do with some cases of where if you um, have ocular massage that can induce a, a vasovagal syncope. You want to have the patient close their eyes and you'll apply a tegaderm which has low grade adhesive just inferior to the eyebrow. You don't want to inadvertently give uh, an eyebrow wax and you're just actually going to just apply a light pressure all around the, the globe itself but you actually don't need to put any pressure on the globe. So as far as the scan technique, you'll need to use the high-frequency linear transducer, which gives you the best resolution at superficial depths. You'll use sterile gel. And then you'll hold the probe close, you'll hold your hand close to the probe head, and you'll have a couple of fingers that are anchored to the building prominence of the face. And this helps to basically prevent undue compression or massage of the globe. So this is a sagittal view right here of the globe with the indicator dot pointed towards the ceiling. And then this is a transverse view with the indicator dot pointed to the patient's right. Next, you want to just demonstrate gentle sliding of the probe, which is actually movement of the probe itself. Um, we're just going from medial lateral and superior to inferior, just like that. And then there's fanning too, or tilting of the probe. You're not actually moving the, the placement of the probe, you're just kind of tilting or fanning to get uh, different cuts of the globe. This is an example of retinal detachment. You can see that the optic nerve sheath is right there, and there's this easily visible layer, uh, which is the retinal layer, and some blood that's in, in behind the retina as well. And if you focus on that with the optic nerve sheath, you'll see that it actually is anchored to the optic nerve. So this is another, um, this is the same example, but it's still image. You have the optic nerve right here, and then you have the retinal detachment on both sides of the optic nerve. Next is a, an example of a vitreous detachment and hemorrhage. You'll notice that basically you're not able to see it in normal gain, so you actually have to increase the gain like this. And when you actually have the patient look left and right, up and down, you'll see this, this vitreous hemorrhage right here. It looks like clothes tumbling in a dryer. Now, I just want to mention that, that these are classic examples of retinal detachment and vitreous hemorrhage and detachment. But there are also retinal tears or small retinal detachments that haven't advanced all the way to the optic nerve. So you may not see the classic attachment to the optic nerve for a retinal detachment. So if you still have a high index of suspicion, you should definitely involve your ophthalmology uh, consultants. Next, let's talk about optic nerve sheath diameter. And uh, basically, you want to get the right depth first. So use this button right here on this machine. And you'll tune it so that uh, essentially you have at least about a centimeter uh, behind or posterior to the optic nerve sheath right here, where you can do a measurement. And then uh, you'll hit freeze, and sometimes you'll, you'll get um, better, more crisper frames if you actually use that toggle button again to, to select the, the clearest frame for measurement. And what you'll do is you'll actually make a, a hit caliper and uh, measure three millimeters um, posterior to the optic nerve insertion in a, a parallel fashion with the optic nerve sheath right here. And then you'll measure a transverse uh, segment and you get 6.4 millimeters and that is typically uh, an indication that there's increased intracranial pressure. This is one study that shows that uh, in ONSD with 5 millimeters which is typically accepted as the upper limits of normal that generally correlates with an ISP of greater than 20 centimeters of water. This is an example of someone with a, a traumatic epidural right here and there's shift and basically you can see that because of the increased intracranial pressure you have distension of the optic nerve sheath right here to 8 millimeters. Okay now it's time for a stretch break. Um, 
We're going to actually talk about peripheral nerves next, specifically of the forearm. Now that you've had your stretch, let's sit back down. And uh, basically, we're just going to briefly go over what muscle and bone look like on ultrasounds. And muscle, if you're looking at the long axis, it'll look like it's treated or you have like a stringy pattern right here. And bone is very hyperechoic with shadowing that's deep to that. There happens to be a fracture right here of this person's bone. In terms of vessels, they typically are pulsatile if they're arteries or compressible. This is a slow motion of the popliteal vein and artery, the arteries below that. And then you can see that um, the nerve right here, this is the tibial nerve. It looks like a honeycomb or a vesicle. So this is what the uh, nerve looks like in the short axis on ultrasound where you have uh, essentially uh, like a vesicular shape or honeycomb shape. Why do they look this way on ultrasound? Well, you have your nerve fibers that are surrounded by endoneurium and they form uh, in bundles called fascicles. And then those are actually in turn surrounded by uh, perineurium, which also contains some of the blood vessels that perfuse the nerves. And then outer to that is the epineurium, which is tough uh, surrounding connective tissue. And so the epineurium is very hyperechoic because it's, it's very tough. Then you also have that perineurium, which is also relatively hyperechoic. And in between, you actually have the fascicles of, of the nerve bundles, which are relatively hypoechoic. So let's focus on forearm nerves. If you expose your volar wrist like this, you'll have this uh, cross-section. And basically, this is the volar aspect, and this is the, the, the dorsal or posterior aspect. And this is towards your thumb or radial. This is towards your pinky or, or ulnar. And what you'll notice is that there are three major nerves in your forearm. You have your, your radial artery nerve right here, your median nerve, and then your ulnar artery nerve. And with your median nerve, you can usually identify that as between your flexi carpi radialis and your pulmonaris longus, whereas your radial and ulnar nerves they actually travel outer to the respective vessels. So for instance, the radial nerve travels radial to the radial artery, and ulnar nerve travels ulnar to the ulnar artery. And you can use the, the bones themselves on ultrasound to locate them. So how do you tell the difference between a tendon versus a nerve? It can be really difficult to tell. Like these are all actually tendons of the flexor digitalis. Uh, like there are nine of those. And somewhere along here, there you actually have uh, the median nerve, which is highlighted in red right here, and there are a couple ways to tell. First, the tendons themselves are going to, if you slide more proximally towards the elbow, they're all going to uh, essentially blend into the muscle fibers of their respective muscle groups, and this is an example of that. So notice this, that it starts to blend into the fascicles of the muscle groups, and then this starts to appear, which is the median nerve right here. Another way you can tell if it, it's a tendon versus a nerve is that especially the median nerve you can actually just kind of flex your fingers or extend your fingers to jiggle the tendons just like this. You'll see that uh, a lot of these jiggle and then uh, basically that tells you that this is the winner, this is the median nerve right here. Okay let's talk about the median nerve. In order to locate it you first identify your flexi carpi radialis and your pulmonaris longus if you have one. And the, the median nerve is typically in between here. It travels a little bit more radial as you go more proximal. And basically you have your FDS, your flexor digitorium superficialis. That's superficial to the nerve. And then below is your flexor digitorium profundus. That's, that's uh, deep to the nerve. And uh, if you scan like this, you'll see this right here. So have the muscle groups, this is the FDS, FDP, and this is your median nerve right here as you go proximally. Next is your radial nerve. Your radial nerve is again radial to your radial artery and uh, on ultrasound it's typically between your radial artery and your actual radius, your bone. And uh, if you fan or if you scan right here, that's more distal towards the wrist, you'll have your radius right here, where our bone is hyperechoic with shadowing. And then you have your, your actual radial nerve, 
and your artery right here. If you slide down a little bit more, you'll get uh, this right here where this is the radial nerve, the artery, and then the, the radius itself. And then this is an uh, this is a scan of this right here, where you basically have this and then the radial nerve. The radial nerve is triangular and it tends to be a little bit flatter, so it's oftentimes a little bit harder to, to identify, but it's right here. Next is your ulnar nerve, and your ulnar nerve has a, a similar configuration to the radial nerve in the sense that you have your ulnar artery, and then ulnar to that is your nerve, and then it's your, your ulna itself is right here. Um, the other thing that, that you may notice is that there's a, there's a tendon that's above called the flexor carpi ulnaris, and um, basically if you scan towards at the level of the wrist, you'll have your ulnar artery and your nerve, and then this is your flexor, your flexor carpi ulnaris, and then this is your, your actual ulna right here. If you scan a little bit more proximally, that nerve will become more apparent, and then the, the FCU, the flexor carpi ulnaris, it starts to blend into the actual muscle fascicles, and the ulna is below right here. So this is ulnar nerve scanning. So you're just going to find it right here. So this is your ulnar artery. So this is nerve and this is FCU right here. Notice how the FCU starts to, to blend into the fascicles right here, whereas the nerve is still preserved right here. Why are we looking at this? You can actually do forearm nerve blocks in regional anesthesia. And it's associated with less anesthetic than you would give in an anatomical block using landmarks. And you also have less tissue distortion or no tissue distortion if you, uh, as compared to local anesthesia. So for instance, if you have this, this hand right here that needs to be evaluated and repaired, if you inject uh, lidocaine all throughout here, it's going to distort the tissue, making it harder for you to, to evaluate the tendons and to make your repair. So you would do uh, essentially a radial and probably ulnar nerve block. The other important point is that you typically your your forearm nerves uh, you're you're not actually causing any motor deficit by blocking those nerves and it's because your radial nerve and your median nerve actually um, very near the elbow they actually bifurcate and form the posterior interosseous nerve and an anterior interosseous nerve uh, which supply the, the relative extensors and flexors of your forearm and wrist. And then your ulnar nerve uh, also supplies the FCU, but it supplies the motor near level the wrist at the interossei, so you do block that. So this is an example of a nerve block. This is the median nerve right here. You have the SD, FDS, FTP below in the median nerve, and all of a sudden you have this long axis image of your needle, and basically you're going to inject above and below the nerve. You don't want to inject into the nerve because that can cause increased distension of the nerve and result in decreased perfusion. Uh, remember those blood vessels are in the perineurium and that can cause ischemia to the nerve. So basically injecting below right now, there's a needle tip and you'll see it go right here and at the very end you'll have that donut sign, which is basically a ring of anesthesia around the nerve. So in summary, we use gain and death to evaluate the retina as well as the optic nerve sheet. And we use calipers to measure the optic nerve sheet diameter in instances where we suspect elevated intracranial pressure. And then we also are able to identify the median radial and ulnar nerves on the forearm and uh, in order to do that you need a slide as well as the fan and tilt a little bit to identify the nerves and uh, we talked about why that's important in terms of regional anesthesia. Thanks for your thorough attention in watching this video. If you have any questions please don't hesitate to contact me.